Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to this vlog 28, writing a book proposal. Now I know many of you have a dream and that dream is to write and to publish a book. It is an oddity, I think, of doctoral education at the moment that we have the assumption that every single PhD student is a 23-year-old young man in the sciences. And a big hi to all the 23-year-old men in the sciences. You're fantastic. But actually, the average age of men and women entering a doctoral program is 34. It, at Flinders, we also have many remarkable PhD students who are in their 60s and their 70s. And I've had the great pleasure to meet these extraordinary men and women. And they're an absolute credit to the university. But so many of you out there watching this vlog have already had outstanding careers. So when I'm providing employment advice to you, you're going, yeah, well, okay, Tara, I've already had a profoundly successful career. You're doing a PhD to transform your life once more, to give your life a third act. And for many of you, that third act involves creating a publishing career for yourself, particularly through books. So today, this vlog has had more requests, I think, than just about any other topic, how to write a book proposal, how to get a book published. So today, I'm going to give you the concrete advice about how to be successful in a competitive publishing environment. And there's absolutely no doubt that book publishing has transformed in the last 20 years, but particularly in the last 10. It is now intensely digital, it's also intensely international. So I'm going to provide some insights and some help so that you can manage this new publishing environment. And what upsets me a lot in Australia at the moment, and can I say you don't hear this in any other country except Australia, is you hear the phrase, and it is unbelievable, books don't matter. Well, let me just state very clearly to you, books do matter. Books are the gold standard of scholarship. At the end of your career, you will be assessed by the calibre and the quality of your books. They are the gold standard. And I still remember, as I reach over for a prop, I still remember my first book uh, being published, Tracking the Jack, A Retracing of the Antipodes. This was published in the year 2000. And like for many of you, I at that point was in a pretty tough uh, job. I was teaching every hour that God could send and that book was written at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. I was living in a pretty rough rental place and life was pretty difficult. And I remember the day when that book arrived in the post. I felt like something had changed in my life. I felt like for the first time really that I was communicating with time. I was part of international scholarship. When you publish a book, that's about as close as most of us ever get to becoming a Time Lord because we suddenly can speak to our future. So never, ever, ever listen to anyone who says that books don't matter. They really do. I'm just about finishing off my 20th book. My 20th book I think will be finished uh, before Christmas. So as you can see, I've had a fair amount of international experience personally and professionally. I also teach publishing. So guys and gals, let me give you the best advice I can give you on this key topic. Also remember that books are your calling card. They are your business card, if you like. As you travel around the world, it is the books that will open doors for you. So this Friday, for example, when I send this vlog to you all, uh, I'm flying out to Prague uh, for a all expenses paid trip uh, to deliver a keynote address at a conference in the beautiful Czech Republic. Now, that invitation emerged a year ago because of a series of my books, particularly the book Digital Dieting. So I have not paid one dollar to go to any conference anywhere in the world since 2002 uh, because I deliver keynote addresses because of my books. Got it? So books are everything. And today I'm going to introduce you to a book 
proposal. Yes, book proposals have a template and today I'm going to go through that template with you. So I know a lot of you have started taking notes, hi Vicky, taking notes during these vlogs. This isn't a bad one maybe to get out some paper and a pen or those of you that are typing at the same time, please do that because I'm going to give you the headings that will structure a book proposal and trust me, this template works. Writing a book is really tough. I'm not going to pretty that up for you. But can I say probably writing a book proposal is even tougher. Remember, the proposal is assessed by a subject editor. So you send it to a publisher, a subject editor looks at the proposal first. And 90, 90% 90 of proposals are stopped at that point. They're gone. So the subject editor stops the proposal. If you get through that first stage, well done, it's then sent to academic referees. Either three academic referees, or in the case of one of my books, Playing on the Periphery, it was sent to seven referees. Why was it sent to seven? Because I was a woman writing on sport and I appeared to know what I was talking about, so they needed to keep talking to referees to just agree, my goodness me, here's a woman writing on sport, does she know what she's talking about? Seven referees. Luckily, they all loved it and it was a book for Rutledge. But all these referee reports go back to the subject editor and all those documents are compiled and sent to a central publishing committee. That committee holds a meeting and your proposal is assessed. It's important to remember though that on that central publishing committee includes marketing representatives. So everything could be right. It could have passed the subject editor. Referees love it. But if the marketing executive at a publishing company does not believe it will sell, then your proposal is gone at that point. It's very important that you remember that we are dealing here with commercial capitalist publishing. You are competing with the world. So my job is to make you competitive in this intense environment. The most difficult seven pages you will ever write is the book proposal. And remember, think about seven pages, that's what we're talking about. Very intense, important writing, but also very, very short. In this case, keep the proposal tight. The subject editor is going to make a decision on your proposal within two minutes. So my job today is to make sure I can get you through that first hurdle. So you simply don't lose the game at that first stage. If it helps you, the book proposal is an advertisement for your work. It's also an advertisement for you. You are marketing yourself. So put the marketing hat on. So do all the obvious things though. So if you're doing a paper submission, make sure it's good quality paper. Make sure the font selection is correct. Make sure there are absolutely no typographical errors and there are multiple ways in which they can contact you. Increasingly though, in fact, almost all publishers now deal with the digital proposal. This poses new challenges. You've got to make sure it looks good on paper, but also looks good on a screen. So again, make sure the font selection is clear and precise. Use color judiciously, but also well. And most importantly, I think PDF that document. PDF the document, render the fonts stable. Because remember, this is moving internationally around publishing houses. Many countries have different font sets, so stabilize it through the PDF. Very important. I've dealt with a lot of publishers, and as I've dealt with more and more publishers, I've realized a singular truth. And that singular truth is, publishers are in the business of risk management. They are continually attempting to mitigate and manage risk with each proposal. It is a ruthless business publishing, and while we may curse the name of editors, how dare they treat our work with such disrespect? Just remember, they might be disrespecting our book, but if they make a mistake, it's their job. You often find that publishers, editors in publishing houses, move through the industry very quickly. They very rarely stay in post for more than two years. So it's a very ruthless business. And if they make a mistake on a book, they take a book on and it loses money. Often they pay for it with their career. Their aim is to reduce 
the risk of the book being a commercial failure. So what you have to do in the proposal is demonstrate how this book is going to sell for them. Help them manage risk. Having said that though, international publishing has transformed radically through digitization. And what I mean now is there's a whole series of new ways in which books are published. Yes, there is the stuff that's made of paper and cardboard, but digital books, e-books, i-books are a whole new big audience. And most importantly for academic books, we particularly see this through Elsevier and through Springer, those guys and gals are selling book chapters. So there's all sorts of new ways in which publishers can make money and yes you can make money. So let's quickly talk through the proposal, the headings you need and what you need to do to be successful. Firstly and most importantly your first title is obviously the title of the book. Now this is crucial. It's different from a PhD title, guys. A PhD title is often descriptive. A book title is sexy. It's innovative. It's a hook into the content. It's a way to sell, to sell that book. Very important. Just about every book I've published has had an incredibly sexy title. Ladies Who Lunge, Tracking the Jack, From Revolution to Revelation, Digital Hemlock, The University of Google, Digital Dieting. Those last two titles, The University of Google and Digital Dieting, have become cliches. When people use those phrases, I was the person who invented them, yeah? But they came from a book title. So make it evocative, expressive, and most significantly, make the title catchy. The title will often be enough to sell the book. Also now, we're structuring the proposal with clear headings. You've got to argue your case. If it helps you get the tone right, on the proposal. This is a marketing document. Do not assume for one moment that international publishers are interested in you or they're interested in the caliber of scholarship. They're not. They're interested in making money. So convince them that you're going to make them money. And you do that firstly by a really evocative, powerful title. Now, the most important part of the proposal outside of the title is the rationale. The rationale. That is your next heading. So you need to explain to the publisher why this book is needed in the crowded publishing market. Why the hell do we need another book on this topic? You answer me that question and write that under the rationale. Also make this expressive writing rather than descriptive writing. You're making a case here. The next page has, and this is a heading, table of contents. Table of Contents, this is a standalone page where you present each of the chapter headings. Again, make it clear, make it punchy, make it evocative. This is not a PhD, so don't have methods literature review. Do not have those headings. Think of an expressive, catchy heading that we can use for a chapter title. Most of us buy a book on the basis of chapter titles and publishers are no exception. So make sure, again, evocative titles on your contents page. Turn the page over. What you then do is present what is in each of the chapters. This is often called chapter synopsis. That's your heading. And then you list those chapter headings and you put three sentences three sentences under each of those headings and explain to the publisher what you're going to do in those chapters. Right, very important page, over we go. The next heading is word length. Word length. Under no circumstances state it's going to be above 70,000 words. 70,000 words is often the absolute maximum for a book. Most are about 60,000 words. Next heading, delivery date. Now state the delivery date, don't spin it, don't spruik it. If they present you with a contract, there are legal consequences if you do not deliver a book by that due date. So work out when you believe you can deliver the book. The book may already be written and you send it with the proposal, that's another issue. But if you're working out how long it will take, please feel free to contact me and we'll talk through perhaps where the PhD is at or where your book is at and how long it will take to get you from there to a finished monograph. 
Next heading, illustrations. Now this is an important tip for punters. Most first authors, for some reason of non-fiction, think the more illustrations, the more likely they are to be successful. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. When publishers see illustrations, they see this book is going to cost me money. Right? So this is important because they've got to pay copyright, it's very expensive for publishing and so forth. So be very clear about the illustrations you will use. And one of the reasons I became a photographer as well as a writer is so I could produce the photographs for my books. So therefore no copyrights involved, I can simply send that over to the publisher, it is theirs, there is no cost. And in fact most of the covers of my books I've actually photographed and designed as well, okay? So keep the illustrations few in number, and if you can actually do them, state that, and you will relax the editor and the publisher. Now, outside of the title and the rationale, the next most important heading, and this is crucial, you will lose the game if you get this heading wrong, and that is target readership. Target readership. Now, this is a moment of decision for you. Your proposal will succeed or fail at this point and the decisions you are about to make. Under no circumstances, no circumstances state that a quote general reader or quote general audience uh, will engage with your book. The moment that an editor sees, or indeed a referee, sees general audience, general reader, immediately your proposal goes in the bin. No academic book has a general audience or a general reader. You've got to work harder than that. So let me help you work hard here. The first decision you have to make is, is this a textbook to be used in class, or is this a scholarly monograph to be used in research by academics. That's your key decision. So for a lot of our guys and gals in legal education and medical education, you might decide the work you've done in your PhD is best suited to a textbook, and that's fantastic. Let me work with you for a moment on this. If it's a textbook, you need to be very precise. Tell me about the type of course, tell me where, which countries, and what level it would be used. So you have to drill down and be as precise as you can for me. Okay, so that's the textbook route. The other route is as the scholarly monograph. Now this is really significant. You need to explain in a crowded publishing market how this scholarly monograph is going to be bought by people. You need to tell me who those people are. You need to talk about you know, what disciplines they are in, are they postgraduates, are they university academics, and we need to be very specific about the regions on the planet and how this book will work in the different regions. Ignore North America, ignore the United States and Canada at your peril. So explain how that book is going to sell in the United States. You've got to be as averse, avert as that. Explain how it's going to sell in Europe, how it's going to sell in South America, Asia Pacific region, and also of course the Middle East. Increasingly important, particularly digital market. So Abdullah, mate, your book is going to be huge in the Middle East. Working on governance in business in the Middle East is a fantastic topic. So you can really make the case that this is going to become the book on business governance in the Middle East. Bang. So explain the market in the Middle East and then show, right, well, it'll also be the book in the field because in Europe, in the United States, we're needing to understand these diverse markets and you're going to provide the answer to those questions, right? Very important. Make the case. Break down the markets for me. So with great precision, demonstrate how your book will enable an audience for those publishers. So remember, publishers are risk managers. Help them understand that you're going to make them money. Okay, the other little tip I'll give you, and this is crucial, is try and make your book fit into an already existing series that the publisher is producing. I certainly got about three books through publishers by saying this book 
fits in your already existing series. Particularly works for Springer and used to work for Ashgate. Ashgate's been bought by Rutledge. We still don't know the degree of independence Ashgate has, but with Springer in particular, so for my science and engineering students who are looking at Springer, try and put your book into a series and you will increase its capacity to sell. This section on audience leads to the next, and the next heading is competing titles. Now, be honest. Again, another way to just simply put your proposal in the bin of an editor is state, this is the only book ever written in the history of the world on this topic, okay? That's nonsense. You know it's nonsense, and you've lost all credibility at this point. So what you've got to do, and this is a lovely, delicate tightrope of a task, is you've got to say, I'm doing all these things that are original and innovative and haven't been done before, but I acknowledge the incredible scholarly field that exists through these series of books and authors. So you need to show that other publishers have mitigated the risk. Other publishers are already in this field and they're making money, so this publisher can take a risk on you, noting the originality of your book and proposal, but also noting that there are other scholars and publishers working in this area. So competing titles, don't think for one moment that logging competing titles hurts your claim. Actually, it enhances your capacity to get that book through. Now, the final two sections are about you and not the book. The first one is obviously biography, so present yourself at your absolute best, explain your writing experience and expertise, even if this is your first book, talk about your social media commitments, which means of course your capacity to sell the book for them, and use a university affiliation if you can. So make yourself appear like you have the capacity to help them sell this book. And finally, present contact addresses. So the multiple ways in which the publisher can contact you. Yes, street addresses, but also email addresses. And again, put in your social media handles. Crucial. Put in your Twitter handle, put in LinkedIn. Because remember, social media sells books. If you can demonstrate that you're social media savvy, that again helps the publisher go, all oh, right, here's a modern person that will help us sell their book. So guys, this is the book proposal. It is, as you can see, an advertisement for a book. It's also an advertisement for you. There are also incredibly important transferable skills that exist from writing a book proposal. As you can see, if you can write a book proposal, it also helps you write a grant proposal. And perhaps even more importantly, it gives you the meta skill of who exactly is your audience? Who are the people who will read your research? And as you move through a PhD, the funny thing about a PhD is it's very self-focused. It can be quite a selfish time. Me, 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 me. As you move through the PhD, there's something very powerful about asking yourself, well, yes, it's all about me, but actually, who will read my work? What is the sociology of my audience? And the answer to that question might surprise you. A lot. Finally, do remember to question anybody who says to you that books don't matter. I'll just finish off with a story about this. Whenever anyone says books don't matter, do have a bit of a look at their CV. And often when people say books don't matter, that's because they don't have any. Uh, I'll just tell a final story about a former head of school of mine who will remain nameless. A former head of school was running a research meeting in the school and lots of people were talking and offering commentary, and he banged his fist on the table, bang, like this, and he said, I'm sick of all this chatter about research, about people who don't know what they're talking about. From this point on in this school, we're imposing a 10, 20, 100 rule. 10, 20, 100 rule. And then there was like this pause, like we're all meant to know what the 10, 20, 100 rule was. So he paused for about 20 seconds. He looked at us all like we're idiots. And, and then he said, 10, 20, 100. No one speaks on research in this school unless you have published 10 books, completed 20 PhD students, 
and published 100 refereed articles, 10, 20, 100. So from that day and since that day, and of course I now am double that, so 20, 40, 200, uh, I'm now double that. Steve Redhead, my beautiful husband, is also double that. So it's about credibility. It's about putting one foot in front of the other and saying, I'm talking about research in an intellectually generous way because I've got my results on the board. And that's the nature of research, guys. No one can ever take those books off you. No one can take that PhD off you. No one can take PhD completions off you. And no one can take those refereed articles off you. If you publish, you are a time lord. You speak to the future. As always, I wish you love, light and peace. Tia.